In the Arctic Ocean, there's two kinds of ice. Some of the ice forms at the shore and it builds out to sea. And then there's pack ice. The pack ice floats free. The winter time, the shore ice and the pack ice meet. Everything freezes over solid. But other times of year, there's an open channel of water between the shore ice and the pack ice. Beluga whale will swim through these open channels of water. They got to swim through open water because they're mammals, right? They can't, they're not fish. They can't just bump up against the ice. They got to get their blowholes to the surface so they can breathe. Polar bears. Polar bears will lie at the edge of these open channels of water, their bellies and snouts flat on the ice, and they'll just lay there, stock still, for hours. When a beluga swims past the polar bear through the open channel of water, the bear will punch the whale. <laughs> Literally, punch the whale in the front of the head, knock it out, and then roll it up onto the ice. Let me repeat that. <laughs> a polar bear. A single 10 foot long, 1800 pound animal. This bear would punch a whale. <laughs> a 20 foot long, 3200 pound whale. This bear would punch a whale in the head, knock it out, and then lift it out of the water. <laughs> this is not an animal, this bear is a god. I literally, for the Eskimo, the polar bear is Nanook. Now, there's a, um, uh, they used to have a bear, a polar bear in the Central Park Zoo. This, uh, this cage, this exhibit, was about 5,000 square feet. Now in the wild, the polar bear's natural home range is 31,000 square miles. That's the size of South Carolina. This kind of blew me away. So to try to get my head around it, I figured I'd do a comparison. I figured I'd, I'd do some math. So for this comparison, I decided to say that my natural home range was the island of Manhattan, 23.7 square miles. So you take the polar bear from his 31,000 square mile home and you put him uh, in a 5,000 square foot cage. Then you take me from my 23.7 square mile Manhattan home and you put me in a cage that's proportionate to the polar bear's cage. And you'll put me in a cage that is 3.8 square feet. That's the size of this handkerchief. And I'd live the rest of my life in this handkerchief sized cage.
My guest tonight is Hero, an 11-foot-tall Asian elephant who was shot to death by a posse of bored Lutherans in 1916. He's come back from the dead to talk with us about language, the uncanny, and hope. We'll also talk about his new book, Hero's Big Idea, where he lays out his controversial grand unifying theory. In the classic issues of Nature and Nurture, you know, in our general understanding of our genetic material, because it's all being decoded, or mostly, and we really have a better understanding of how we interact with it and how, how it interacts with the environment. So what is the deal with nature nurture? Well, it turns out to be enormously complicated and really interesting, and I started to envision the genome as a kind of cloud that is interactive with the environment, with language, with economics, with psychology. And this leads me to think, I want to do the book to be, in a way, analogous to the genome. And the genome accumulates bits and pieces of genetic material. They get uh, viruses that are incorporated. So I just started incorporating a fair number of things that are just true stories that I just stick in the book. Here are the elephants for the hour. Next. Funding for Larry Stone has been provided by the following. The Center for Advanced Study, the University of Illinois Office of Public Engagement, the University Research Board, and the Creative Capital Fund. Additional funding for Larry Stone was also provided by these funders. And now, from the Stock Pavilion in Urbana, Illinois, this is Larry Stone. Hero the Elephant is here. He was a circus elephant that lived a short life. His most recent and only book, Hero's Big Idea, looks at many provocative subjects. Hero suggests that poetry is chemistry, sex is song, and economics is myth. Public knows nothing about him, hasn't had any reason to follow him, and has never heard of him. He lived to the age of 20 and died 94 years ago in a South Dakota farm town. I'm pleased to have him in this arena. Welcome. Thank you, Larry. Tell me about your big idea. How did you decide, and I must say I'm fascinated by your choice, that this was the subject you wanted to write about? Well, Larry, I, I love a good cheese sandwich. I start with a rosemary olive loaf, and I love this bread. And then I, I add, add a little mustard. I like the stone ground mustard. It's got the brown flex, the, uh, the mustardiness. And then I, then I go with cheese. I like a sharp cheddar. I don't like extra sharp, but I really don't like mild, because it's just so close to American cheese, which is, you know, basically worthless. So I, I, like, I like a good sharp cheddar from, uh, uh, you know, Oregon, Tillamook, maybe Wisconsin. Lands of cheese. Yes. Now with cheddar, we got mild, medium, sharp, extra sharp. We got uh, uh, versions of cheddar. Colby, Monterey Jack, sometimes yellow cheddar, white cheddar. Sometimes they put stuff in the cheese. Garlic, jalapenos, sun-dried tomatoes. Yeah, and personally, I'm against these things, but there you are. That's just cheddar. Hundreds of other kinds of cheese, all basically forms of milk. 2% whole, half and half, uh, butter. I mean, my God, it goes on forever. Let's recap. Cows, milk, cream, cheese, hundreds of varieties, subtle differences. You're talking about nuance. Mm -hmm. Now, Larry, I, I love a good grilled cheese. I love it. But all this lactose nuance would be lost on a lot of the world. Now, of course, milk and cheese is uh, repulsive to much of the world's population. Sure, you don't like milk, so who cares if it's 2% or fortified? It's all disgusting. In your book. You spend a whole chapter writing about snow and ice. Why? It's like cheese. Now, we all heard about uh, Eskimos and snow. This makes sense. You know, one kind of snow holds a, holds a dog sled, 
Another kind of slow will toss, snow will toss you and the dogs in the ocean. You have to pay attention. Yeah. Let's head to uh, uh, 1920s, okay? Mm -hmm. So we, we got Sir William Thessinger, this British guy traveling with the Bedouin tribes of uh, uh, the great deserts of Oman, Iraq, uh, Egypt, traveling on camels. Mm, camels were important. Ships of the desert. Yeah, pro probably the most important thing for the Bedouin. So important that they didn't just have one name for camel. Lots of different names. A, a name for a one-year-old female, a female three months pregnant, a ten-year-old bull. All different names. Interesting. Subtle variations. Okay, good. All right, let's, let's head further east. India, Thailand, Southeast Asia. We got elephants, like me. This is where I was born. They caught me, shipped me off to the States when I was four years old. Okay, so here we got working elephants, uh, wild elephants. We got the mahouts, the keepers of the elephants. Oh. They got all these different names for the different stages of life. A three-month-old baby, a 45-year-old bull, all different names. Devil is in the details. Got it? <laughs> yeah, you better pay attention to details too, Larry. I mean, things like snow, a runaway camel, a herd of elephants, you better pay attention to details because what you don't know might kill you. All tangible, physical stuff. You can smell a camel, taste the cheese, get buried in snow. What else do we have in our language with subtlety and variation? Money. Ah, money. Let's roll tape. Here's a couple of ways to get on and off an elephant. No stirrups, no saddles, no ladders. Here we go. You stand up close to the right side of the elephant, right up next to its right shoulder. Never stand next to its left shoulder. I don't know why, but if the mahout tells me not to stand next to the left side of the nine-foot-tall, five-ton elephant, I will take his word for it. Now, when you're up this close to an elephant, it's like you're face up against a gray, wrinkly wall. You can't see anything else. You give the command, song, song, and if the elephant doesn't wrap its trunk around your torso and tear you in half, here's what happens. You, the mahout in training, you put your hands up over your head, you put your right hand on top of the right ear, your left hand, you put it on the gray, wrinkly wall. Grab a handful of elephant skin. It's like heavy, padded canvas. Your elephant lifts his right foot. You put your right foot on the raised right knee. One, two, three, hop. You push down with your right foot. Your elephant boosts you up. Pull on the right ear and the right shoulder. Swing your left leg up and over. You are on an elephant. Congratulations. Here's a couple of other ways to get on and off an elephant. And that is how you get on a working elephant. How do you get on a wild elephant? You don't. I asked why a culture of working elephants had grown in Asia, not Africa. And I was told that African elephants are too big. They're too aggressive. They're two feet taller. They're two tons bigger. They have names like Vinny. They carry switchblades. <laughs> Nobody wants to ride them. all started uh, there's different stories on it as it gone down through the years but there was a circus in town it was kind of right over here where the railroad is now where the tracks oh I guess we can't see it but there was a depot there and the circus had unloaded or was unloading and setting up and the uh, trainer had got in some moonshine that was you know going through the country and he start whipping the elephant around of course, they say that, well, I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that elephants can't stand the smells or anything of it, or couldn't uh, bootlegging whiskey anyhow. And so he started to chase the trainer. Well, the trainer went under the tracks, went under the cars, and the elephant followed him through. And this tore up the tracks, tore up the cars and stuff because of it. And then he rampaged through the town. 
well, I, I don't know how, how many people took a shot at him. I guess that's the way it gets. But when, we, when they finally got him, we have the gun here that they shot him with. Now, they made steaks out of the, out of the, there was a hotel where the Senex station is now, and um, they made steaks out of, uh, for the hotel out of it. Um, they brought the guy down from South Dakota State to come skin the elephant. I went to school with the grandson of the guy that skinned it, or great-grandson, or, or whatever, and um, he sent me a hide, a piece of the hide of it. And the one guy, the grandson of the guy that did it, had a piece of hide, had it tanned, and had an overnight bag made out of it. So we've had elephant days, um, rummage sales primarily, to commemorate elephant day. It was the 16th of May. There was, um, yeah, they, they, well, they still have, it's not a big deal anymore, but they do still have kind of rummage sales and, and things on that day. In January 1916, we bought a big elephant named Hero. He was nearly 11 feet tall and weighed 10,000 pounds. He was known as the biggest elephant in captivity. They had a 100-foot round top with one ring circus, very similar to the old show their father Hiram ran before them. Uncle Miles came in the fall of 1897 to Ortonville, Iowa, from Detroit, Michigan, with his family, and had some dogs and, and two ponies that were trained. Myron Orton, my cousin, did a slack wire. Bernie Orton also was with them and did a tight wire bounding act and head balancing on trapeze and and a good performer. My brother Lawrence learned a two-pony standing act. Al Armour was the clown, and Charlie Bell was the band leader. This show had good crowds, but the price of 10 and 20 cents was not enough to keep it on the road. The date was May 15th, 1916. The show was in Elkton, South Dakota. The weather was very bad that day, cold and snowy. We always used the big elephant to pull the stakes. Generally, he, he was a good worker and, and was well trained. But Hero was having one of his bullying spells. You chain them down during these times. Even then, they can break away and do damage. Then two animal men will feed them dope. This is done to keep them from going on a rampage. The snow seemed to help make the big elephant mean. The keeper was careless and did not dope him up. He thought he could handle him. After he got through pulling the stakes, they went over to the water wagon. The elephant came up against the water wagon so hard and went down across the lot so fast that the keeper had to stop and flog him. When he tried to hook his ear, the, the elephant dodged, and, and before we knew it, the animal had got up on his feet and hit the keeper. The keeper lit out 30 feet straight ahead, flat on his back his hook 30 feet out to one side. Before the keeper could get up, the elephant was there, sliding around in the mud, trying to make a headstand on him. Hero would try to get the, the thick part of his trunk at about the place his tusks would be. Hero no longer had tusks. He, he had gored to death two ponies in this manner, and, and then he would walk on them until they were flattened out. This was what he was trying to do to the keeper. On account of the mud and, 
and the elephant sliding around, the keeper was able to get away from him and, and on the other side of the water wagon. The elephant thought he was under the wagon, so, so he ran into the side of the wagon, upsetting the whole thing, and got up on top of it and walked all over it, breaking the wagon all to pieces. I went into a hotel close by and got an automatic 12-gauge shotgun and, and started out to meet the elephant. A young fellow named of Louis Gaston from Des Moines was with the show, and he had gone uptown and, and got a double-barrel shotgun and, and was over the other side of the lot. The elephant got his head against the bandwagon and pushed it to the ground upside down. The next was the lion den with four young lions in it, but before he, before he could push it off the flat, Louis Gaston had gotten up close behind a tree and, and took a shot at the elephant. He must have hit him in the eye and put it out because the elephant dropped down on his knees, got up and left town. Louis and I started after him. We would take a shot at his rump and, and then dodge around some house and the elephant would go on. Louis got on a horse and, and someone handed him a 25-20 rifle. By this time, the elephant had gotten out into the country. Louis rode his horse around directly in the path of the elephant about 50 yards ahead and, and got off his horse and kneeled down and took a good aim and, and shot the elephant square between the eyes. But it did not stop him. If anything, he gained speed. I could see the elephant was going to get him, so, so I hollered at Louis, leave that horse and run, you darned fool, run. And Louis did run, believe me. And the elephant was right after him, reaching out to get him. Louis was running in a circle, so, so I ran to the center of the circle and, and took a shot at his other eye. And just as quick as I shot, the elephant stopped running and, and started off in another direction. And today, I believe that Louis Gaston can owe his life to that shot because that elephant was was gaining on him all the while. The elephant was going in a circle now. Both of his eyes were out. And he was going through barbed wire and, and board snow fences and, and was running against telephone poles and knocking them over. I could follow him on the horse because he took the fences with him. Good evening. Tonight you're going to hear some stories. They're all a little bit different, but they're all a little bit the same. I guess you could say they're related. Let's start with some pictures. The mouse lemur from Madagascar, possibly the smallest of the primates, fits in the palm of your hand. Human being, Homo sapiens. This one's 5 foot 11 and 185 pounds. We don't know when he'll die, but on average, he'll live to be about 75. The gorilla. This one weighs 900 pounds, and as you can see, it takes 21 men to carry him. The howler monkey, almost entirely arboreal. The howler is the loudest animal in the New World. Hanuman. Hanuman is an incarnation of Shiva. Hanuman is a magic monkey able to make himself smaller than the mouse lemur and thousands of times larger and stronger than the biggest gorilla. The monkey king, born out of rock, trapped under a mountain for 500 years able to transform himself into 72 different creatures, 
traveled with a monk, a pig, and a sea monster into the West. Many primates learn by watching and imitating. Monkey see, monkey do. A network of tiny electrodes was implanted into the motor cortex of a monkey's brain. With the monkey's own arms restrained, he was able to control a robotic arm and feed himself. Monkey think, monkey do. Tools can be thought of as extensions of the body. Tools make you stronger. Tools make you faster. Early humans used complex tools made of stone, bone, antler, and ivory. They wore personal ornaments. They buried their dead with rituals. They played bird bone flutes. They were avid hunters able to take down large and dangerous game. Some humans used monkeys as tools. During the Southern Song Dynasty in a battle between the rebels and the Chinese Imperial Army, monkeys were clothed in straw, dipped in oil, set on fire, and released into the enemy camp. The panicked monkeys, burning alive, set tents ablaze, and drove the camp into chaos. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. The three wise monkeys were Mizuru, who sees no evil, Kikazuru, who hears no evil, and Iwazuru, who speaks no evil. Sometimes a fourth monkey was depicted. Shizuru does no evil. He was shown covering his crotch. <laughs> During the era of the great warships, the days of sails, cannons, and scurvy, they had to find a way to stack the cannonball so they wouldn't roll overboard. A device known as a monkey was invented. The monkey was a flat square tray made of brass set directly into the deck of the ship. Indentations held the balls, which were stacked in a pyramid. At times, naval strategy required the ships to sail through Arctic waters. At 40, 50, 60 below zero, the world changes. Trees steam. Spit freezes before it hits the ground. Everything is white. And metal contracts. Some metals more than others. The brass of the monkey would contract more than the cannonballs, the balls would roll overboard, and all the sailors would say to each other, Arr, shiver me timbers. It's cold enough to freeze the balls off a brass monkey. How about another story? Here's a story about traps. There's all kinds of traps. Booby traps, deadfall traps, mouse traps, speed traps, sand traps, welfare traps. Sometimes you don't even know if you're in a trap, and then if you finally figure it out, well, it's probably too late. How about a monkey trap? Here's the basic idea. A hunter digs a hole. Hunter puts something delicious in the hole, something the monkey can't resist. The monkey smells the delicious thing, finds the hole, reaches into the hole, grabs the treat. But here's the deal. When the monkey tries to pull his fist out of the hole, he can't. You see, the hole is too small. His fist is too big. So the monkey's got to make a choice. Now, wherever you find monkeys, you'll find this sort of trap all over the world. You got the South American monkey trap, the Malaysian monkey trap. You got monkey traps on the Congo River, monkey traps on the Amazon River. The treat in the trap, well, it might be sweet, sweet rice, a fruit, a nut, something shiny. The trap itself might be a hole in the ground or a gourd. Maybe it's a wooden box. The monkey might be a spider monkey or a howler. Maybe it's a macaque. But that's just monkeys, right? I mean, sure, they're, they're pretty smart as far as animals go. They got opposable thumbs. Some have prehensile tails. The kids hang out with the moms for a long time. But they're not apes. Now you see apes. Apes are smart. With apes, you got gorillas, orangutans, bonobos, and chimpanzees. You and I, us humans, you all know this. We share 99% of our genetic material with chimps. Apes can learn language. Apes can use tools. Apes are really smart compared to monkeys. Apes are super monkeys. And humans are super apes. And gods are superhuman. Now, I like to think that most of us aspire to the superhuman end of the scale, but come on. Everybody's got their monkey moments. And that's why the monkey trap metaphor is used by all kinds of folks, shrinks, priests, military analysts, investment bankers. 
And the moral of this story, this story told all over the world, this, this story with its interchangeable but basically similar components, the moral of the story is this. Don't be greedy. Open your hand. Let go of the treasure. You can't have it all. <laughs> to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. The ways of the wild may seem strange to us because we've never seen them before, or because we don't understand them, or because they're so odd that we can scarcely believe them. Now, would you believe, for example, that a chimpanzee such as Mr. Moke, star performer of the chimpanzee show here at the St. Louis Zoo, is uh, ticklish? And we we'll laugh out loud. <laughs>
Once upon a time, there was an army of monkeys. They were known as the Barbary Apes, but in truth, they were macaques, a type of monkey. Their faces are pink, their fur is brown. They live to the age of 22. They make their home in Morocco, the Atlas Mountains of Algeria, and Gibraltar. Like Gibraltar, these monkeys exist between worlds, balanced on the cusp of the East, the West, and Africa. Legend has it that as long as the Barbary apes roam the Rock of Gibraltar, the territory will remain safely under British rule. In 1944, with British morale battered by the war and the rock's monkey population dwindling, Churchill took no chances. He ordered a shipment of Barbary apes from Morocco, a short hop across the strait. Sixty years later, in 2003, Britain the United States and a coalition of nations were poised to invade Iraq. The Kingdom of Morocco allegedly supported the coalition by offering 2,000 Barbary apes trained to defuse landmines. These fearless monkeys, dwelling between night and day at the edge of the world, the stuff of prophecy, an elite army of magic monkeys. And magic they must be. Only 2,000 Barbary apes remain on our planet, yet every single one of them volunteered to serve in this primate army. Where does their power come from? Who is their leader?
I sat on a bus in Yellowstone, the first morning of a wolf management workshop. New snow blanketed the valley, all eyes scanning for dark movement on the white land, and yeah, there, there in the distance, there they were. We watched three wolves chasing a fourth, all of them running as fast as they could, running, running like they would never stop. Where were they going? What were they doing? And as I watched them, I thought about very different ways of being in the world. Ways that have nothing to do with myth, or dreams, or language. The bus got stuck in traffic, a wolf jam. Across the river, a hundred yards away, the alpha pair had taken a deer down. Someone hissed, it's alive. The deer, pregnant, still breathing, lifted its head only to watch the wolves eat the fetus. They pulled out viscera, they tore off muscle, their faces were covered in blood. A grizzly bear charged the wolves off their meal. The bear ate the deer. A week later I had dinner with a friend, a veterinarian. I told him about this Yellowstone encounter and the vet said, didn't you want to intervene? I said, why? He said, when animals are killing each other, I want to stop them. I didn't know what to say. Once upon a time, the big bad wolf was running through the forest, climbing up the mountain, hiding in the desert, swimming in the ocean. He had a terrific backstroke. The ladies watched him. He did it very well. All the ladies imagined he did everything very well. But the big bad wolf wasn't thinking about the ladies. As he did lap after lap, he wrestled with a problem. 
You see, a woodsman had come into the valley. This woodsman had a big red mustache. He had sparkling cold black eyes. He drove a little ATV with three giant balloon tires. He drank. You could smell it. It was like somebody had dragged an open keg of whiskey through the woods. He wasn't a bad man. You could smell that too. He lived in a cabin. He had a porch. He had a coon dog. The coon dog slept under the porch and didn't seem to have a lot going on upstairs. A couple of cupcakes short of a birthday party. Not the sharpest tool in the shed, this coon dog. Slept and ate and drank and drooled. The woodsman sharpened his axe and kept track of his crampons. He looked to his leather harnesses and hard hats. He polished his boots and oiled his chainsaw, and he took very special care of his walkie-talkie. The walkie-talkie would crackle the life every morning at 4.30. By this time, the woodsman would be working on a second stack of flapjacks. He woke at 3.30, like a clock he was. He woke up every morning, 3.30 a.m. on the dot. He poured the milk, measured the flour, cracked the egg, stirred the batter, heat the skillet, a little bit of oil, till the oil floats on that hot metal. And then, the first ladle of batter. You wait for it to bubble before you flip it, and then when it bubbles, you flip it. Now, after flipping it, it's kind of by feel. You don't have any specific visual warning signs like bubbles. But if you make enough pancakes, you begin to develop an inner rhythm. Not so different than the biological clock that wakes a man every morning at 3.30 a.m. on the dot. The 4.30 call on the walkie-talkie would tell him to do this and that. It ordered him around. It bossed him over here. It bullied him over there. But he listened. Sometimes he took notes on a little spiral notebook he kept in his shirt pocket. And after the squawking, cackling box went dead, the woodsman pulled on his cap laced up his boots, and stepped off at the porch and into the woods. Sometimes the coon dog came with him. But sometimes the coon dog slept in, followed his scent later on, after the sun had come up and civilized beings walked the earth. Darkness was a time to hedge bets, recharge the batteries, take stock of the coming dawn. Darkness was a time to sleep. Meanwhile, the big bad wolf was filling up in the interstate. He just got off a shift at the casino. He felt pretty good. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. He had to get to L.A. by 8 a.m. He had a meeting with a woodsman. He'd make it. It's not the best time to be driving around Vegas, 2, 3 a.m. God knows what happens in Vegas at 3 a.m. He imagined mushroom clouds rising off the desert floor. He imagined aliens, the mothership, sucking unconscious, smiling people out of the glowing casinos, drifting up into the dark sky. He imagined desert creatures floating up out of their dens and burrows and perches, snakes twisting weightlessly in the air, coyotes tumbling softly in the night, a giant desert tortoise pulled into a shell spinning like a slow top. The wolf finished filling the tank, screwed on the cap, got the receipt, lifted his leg on the pump, and drove. He was listening to AM radio, picking up KGO out of San Francisco. The nighttime callers seemed even more desperate and deranged than they used to, but he didn't care. He listened anyway. When the commercials came on, he flipped off the radio, rolled down the windows, and maybe, maybe he'd howl a little bit. But probably not. You gotta keep your eyes closed when you howl, so it's not a good idea to be howling when you're driving. Big Bad Wolf and the Woodsman had a beer. They sat at the bar. The Woodsman had a Budweiser. The Wolf asked for a double-hopped IPA that they did not have. He ended up with a Heineken. He hated it, but he didn't want to seem fussy. He realized that a fussy wolf wasn't going to help anybody. He needed to appear calm and relaxed. He needed to give off an air of, of poise and self-control. Woodsman seemed like, seemed like a nice guy, maybe. 
The wolf big was also nice. He wasn't necessarily bad. He didn't mind being inside, and he didn't mind being outside in a sub-zero 25-mile-an-hour wind, but if he had a choice between sitting outside in an 80-below wind chill and sitting inside drinking shitty beer, talking to somebody he didn't like very much, he'd take his chances and sit inside. The wolf said, Look, uh, I don't want to be combative, because honestly, I, I want to thank you for reaching out like this, but the fact you re remains that your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather filled the belly of my ancestor with stones and threw them in the river. This is a story we still tell amongst ourselves. It's, it's not something we're willing to forget, because clearly, this is something you people are capable of. <laughs> and how does somebody even come up with that? Even as a superstition, it's just, well, primitive magical thinking at its ugliest. The wolf put his beer down in the bar. He lit a cigarette, took a long drag. God, you know, maybe he would prefer it outside after all. He just made things very uncomfortable. No, 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 no. He had to bring it up. If he didn't put it on the table, he'd just spend the whole time stewing. The woodsman smiled. He took a pull on his beer. And then he, was that a giggle? Did he just chuckle? No, he couldn't believe it. I mean, it, it, see, as a younger wolf, Big would have ripped his throat out right there. Would have been easy. But Woodsman took a sip of beer, the head tilted back, the beard lifted up. There it was, soft white neck. Probably hadn't seen the sun in 25 years. Easy, simple. You know, whatever, said the Woodsman. He said, bad, it's going to rain. You know it's coming. When it comes, it's going to come hard. And Big said, big, it's big, not bad. And no, I don't. What are you talking about? The smile faded from the woodsman's lips. He took another pull on the bottle. And he said, don't play coy. All you got to do is look around my cabin once or twice. I've seen you do it. I know you do it. Matter of fact, I've seen you do it all over the valley, my friend. I, I watch you. I've seen it when you run. I watch you when you, uh, when you lurk. <laughs> yeah, you and your lady, your little, your little pack there. Sure, you got skills, but you know what? So do I. So all that shit stacked around the cabin, all that strapped down blue tarp, don't tell me you haven't wondered what it was. Don't tell me you don't know what it is. I didn't. I don't, said the wolf. Was it just him or was the bar suddenly a lot warmer? The world, the dark tunnel, the sound all gummy and muddled. Why, why, why had he agreed to this meeting? Let me tell you what stacked around my cabin. The boxes, the crates, the sacks, the bushels and bags and barrels and kegs and packages. All of it is poison. All of it is chains, iron steel, blankets with small box, showers with gas, leg traps and bullets, guns and stairs, strychnine, weapons, all of it. The world was a pinpoint of light. He let his guard down. He got soft. And now this. The wolf said, why traps? Why poison? The woodsman laughed. Then the woodsman stopped. He put his bottle down on the bar. He reached out and he stroked the wolf's soft, soft ears. And he whispered, It's for you, my brother. It's all for you. And your lady puppies. The wolf couldn't feel the woodsman bending his ears. He could barely hear him. Everything had gone black. Big said, why poison puppies? The woodsman stopped petting the wolf. He signaled the bartender, couple shots right here. The wolf said, I don't drink whiskey. The woodsman said, they're for me. Now look, you're a smart guy. You live in the valley. You got ears. You know which way the wind's blowing. Don't 
don't tell me you haven't heard this now. Snow White. Uh, come on, are you living under a rock for Christ's sake? Snow White, the dwarves, the free love, the patchouli, the dwarf crap with the tie-dye and the tents. It's a cover, fuck, cover, whatever. Maybe that's just what rich girls do. She came into her money. She bought the valley. She's bringing in cattle. She's liquidating the forest. Yeah, I know, I know. I saw her last week, you barely recognize her. She got a haircut. She's buying buildings in Shanghai. She's buying up valleys all over. She's got to protect her investment, something. So I'm sorry, my friend, but the, you got to go. The wolf said, but we don't eat cow. Hmm, yeah, well, but you might, especially when the forest is gone and the, the deer, the elk, the moose, the buffalo, the beaver, and rabbit, the muskox, reindeer, caribou, and when everything is gone and all that's left is cows and corn and cement as far as the eye can see, I imagine you might end up eating some cows. It's nothing personal. I mean, you know that, right? It's my job, you know, I got to do what the walkie-talkie tells me to, you know, I got to eat, got to take care of my family. The wolf said, but you don't have a family, you just have that dog. Hey, don't get technical, you know what I'm talking about. But no, the wolf had no idea what he was talking about. He said, you know, I, I'm going to go, but thanks for the beer, it was delicious. And I got to say, I appreciate the heads up, thanks. The woodsman said, no, come on, don't go, please, have another beer, please sit down. No, the wolf had to go. He could feel the dark tunnel lifting, the weakness leaving his body like toxic gas, and there it was, not too hot, not too cold, just right. He knew what he had to do. He said, see you around, and he ran out of the bar. He ran through the dark forest, back to his den. He ran past border patrols, secret police, gangs of thugs, posses of righteous men, packs of bloodhounds searching for escaped slaves, bounty hunters, desperate farmers, starving ranchers. He ran into his den, slipped under the rug, down to the trapdoor, into his secret den basement. He pulled out his crystal radio set, and he started his broadcast. Calling all wolves. Calling all wolves. It has begun. Fire. Poison. Rain of lead. Rain of death. Run. Run, my brothers and sisters. Run for your lives. <laughs>